This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All Hit Radio! Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Friday edition of the X Zone Radio Show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, heard around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. Worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all major uh, social networking sites, Xzone Radio TV, and our main website where you can listen to the Xzone Radio Show, 724-365, www.xzoneradiotv.com. We're coming into the month of June, and on June 26, 27, and 28 in Brantford, Ontario, will be the very first Alien Cosmic Expo. It's going to be held in Brantford, like I said, and the 24 of the world's leading authorities are going to be there. They're going to be speaking. They're going to be meeting and greeting people. If you've had an experience that you want to share with someone who cares, someone who will believe Someone who will not make fun of you, this is the place to go. The Alien Cosmic Expo, June 26, 27, 28, in Brantford, Ontario. All the information you need about this great event can be found on their website at www.aliencosmicexpo.com. In fact, my guest this very first hour for Friday, May 29th, 2015, is the Right Honorable Paul Hellier. Now, Paul Hellier is Canada's Senior Privy Councillor. He's been appointed to the Cabinet of Pierre Minis- uh, Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent in 1957, just eight years after his first election to the House of Commons in 1949 at the age of 25. He subsequently held senior posts in the government of Lester B. Pearson and Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who defeated him for the Liberal leadership in 1968. Now, the following year, after achieving the rank of Senior Minister, which was later designated Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Hellier resigned from the Trudeau Cabinet on a question of principle related to housing. Now, although Mr. Hellier is best known for the unification of the Canadian Armed Forces and for his 1968 chairmanship of the Task Force on Housing and Urban Development, he has maintained a lifelong interest in macroeconomics. Now, through the years as a journalist and political uh, commentator, he has continued to fight for economic reforms and has written several books on the subject. Undoubtedly a man of many interests, Mr. Hellier's ideas are not classroom abstractions. He was born and raised on a farm, and his business experience includes manufacturing, retailing, construction, land development, tourism, and publishing. He has also been active in the community affairs in the the community, including arts and studied voice at the uh, Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. His multifaceted career, in addition to a near lifetime in politics, gives Mr. Hellier a rare perspective on what goes wrong in the critical fields of both world politics and economics. In recent years, he has become interested in the extraterrestrial presence and their superior technology that we have been uh, emulating. In September 2005, he became the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of countries to state unequivocally, listen to this, UFOs are real as the airplanes flying overhead. 
Mr. Hellier continues an interest in these areas and provides a bit of basic information about them in his new book. And we're going to be talking to Mr. Hellier about his new book as he joins us now from Toronto. And Mr. Hellier, always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. Rob, good to hear your voice again. How are you, sir? It's been a long time since you and I have had the opportunity of of talking, but I must say, sir, that I am so glad you're coming to Brantford on June 24, 25, 20, I'm sorry, 26, 27, 28, because I will finally have the opportunity of shaking your hand and thanking you for all your wonderful years of service to this great country of ours. Well, interestingly enough, I was born about 15 miles from there. I actually uh, sold fruit on the Brantford market, which is where the, um, the place is that we're going to be meeting. Yes. Um, I understand you have a new book, sir. Yes, it's called The Money Mafia, A World in Crisis. Oh. And I had no intention of writing it because um, I think we discussed my previous uh, book, uh, Light at the End of the Tunnel. Yes. A Survival Plan for the Human Species. And I really thought that was my magnus opum, as they say, and Mm -hmm. uh, that I had nothing more to say. When uh, various things happened, I, I was part of a group that um, were assembled to uh, for a citizen's uh, disclosure hearing in, in uh, Washington uh, two years ago this month, and um, it, it was such a, a, an illuminating thing in the sense that we had six form, former Congress people there, and uh, they were acting as if they were, um, were an actual congressional committee. Mm-hmm. And uh, we gave uh, testimony for five days. That took took us five days to persuade all six of them that UFOs were real and that the ET technology was real and that the U.S. Uh, had been back engineering this uh, technology and that the American people had been paying for it, even though as, con- as Congress people they didn't know that they were doing this and so on. And... Uh, so I decided that there was such a, a naivety that it was really alarming, really, uh, such a naivety about what was really going on in the United States and in the world that I just had to dash back and mm-hmm. start writing, which is exactly what I did. And it took me a year and a half to uh, complete the, uh, the new book, uh, The Money Mafia, and uh, to, to make it available to people who, A, care about the future of the United States and or the world, and B, um, has an action plan, which if followed might change the course of history. The problem is getting anybody to listen, anybody to buy the book, anybody to take the action that it recommends there, and uh, one can only hope, but uh, I have done my best to make it available, and (laughs) I'm still hoping and doing everything I can to promote not the book necessarily, because I don't make my living from selling books, but to get the ideas out there and hopefully to get enough people interested in what's going on and what they should know that they're willing to take time out and form a huge political uh, movement, just demanding some of the changes that I have recommended and which are necessary and for the future of the world. So that's about where I'm coming from at the moment, Rob. Mr. Hellier, when you look at the state of the world, we have China that are that is building islands in territory 600 miles off its coast in international waters, threatening overflying military flights from the United States who are doing a reconnaissance mission to find out what the Chinese are up to. When we When you see what is happening with the Uh, government or lack of government in North Korea. We've got what's going on with ISIS. We have what's going on throughout the Middle East. As a man who has given so much of his life to politics to to bringing peace, where, where did we go wrong, sir? Growing up as a child in Canada, I cannot remember, I cannot remember for the life of me, these type of problems. No, and they didn't exist then. It's all relatively new. Well, some of them are. The, mm-hmm. the, the one problem that I've been most interested in for a long, long period of time that's worth talking about is the banking cartel. And it's uh, it's been one of the major problems in the world 
responsible for the Great Depression of the 1930s and uh, and the Great Recession that we're still in now and uh, and the recessions of 1981, 82, and 1991, and uh, more poverty than you can shake a stick at. That's an old problem that's been around for a long while. But what happened after World War II, there was a period, uh, some of us referred to them as the golden years, when the division of income between uh, between labor, capital, and government was reasonable. And everybody was reasonably happy, and things were going along just, uh, you know, fine, until... I guess the very rich decided that um, labor is getting too much and the middle class was uh, developing faster than they liked. And so they began a campaign to undo the positive things that were done in the early post-war years. And they've been working at at it ever since. And they're really, um, and this is one of the things I talk about in my book, now they're planning... um, what they call a new world order, which in in effect is nothing more than a, uh, well, let's be honest about it, it's a, sort of a fascist, fascist state mm-hmm. to run the whole world for their benefit. So it, instead of it being government of, by, and for the people, it's going to be government of, by, and for what I call the cabal, which we can define a little bit more if you wish. And, uh, and really makes uh, debt slaves of of the rest of us, just two classes of people, the ultra-rich and the the working poor. And you may have noticed the figure in the paper just a few, I guess it was days ago, or it might have been a couple of weeks ago, where 80 families own uh, 50% of all the wealth in the world. 80 families. The year before, it was 88 families. So you can see that this tremendous concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands has been part of the plot all along. It's still going on. And unless it stops, um, there's going to be terrible, terrible trouble. And I, for one, uh, am dedicated to try and see if we can't change the monetary and banking system and uh, cut the head off the serpent, as I call it, uh, right. before it's too late. Well, I'll bet you on that list the name, the family name Hellier isn't there because I know for a fact the name McConnell isn't there. So is there anything we can do, Mr. Hellier, to, to try and balance the, the two, you know, super rich to super poor? Is there something that we can do to bring both parties on a par level? Well, I, I don't think on a par level. I don't think that's possible. It's all there's always been uh, rich and uh, mm-hmm. and less rich, but a little more decency, a little more justice. That's the thing, and uh, and fewer fewer than the millions or billions of people now who are really debt slaves, mm-hmm. and spend all of their lives working in order to pay interest on money that was created out of thin air that they had to borrow from the from the banking cartel. I don't think most people realize what money is and how important it is to understand it. And that's, of course, one of the reasons I've written several books on the subject. And, uh, and this latest one is, the, is probably the most provocative and probably the easiest to, uh, to understand of the, of the several that I've written. And that is that um, most money is, is just virtual money. <clears throat> we have a handful of change mm-hmm. in our pocket, and we may have... Uh, you know, a, a few bills in the in a pocketbook or a purse, and uh, that's just for occasions when we have to use cash. But that that kind of money, which is known as legal tender, is there's only about two or three percent of the whole world's money supply that is really legal tender. The rest is just virtual money, is created created out of thin air, and it winds up as bank deposits, which are used as money. And we pretend that they are money because that's the way the, the powerful people have, um, have conditioned us to think. And uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's really a, a, well, it's a sad affair. And if you want to go back to, you know, the, about two or 300 years ago, um, 
when King William was fighting the war on uh, on the continent and uh, needed more money to uh, mm-hmm. to improve his uh, navy and so on, he made a deal because his credit was no good to uh, get Parliament to approve the Bank of England, give them rights to uh, handle the government's money and to and to create money. And what he did, they, they the, the rich people over there put a, a million two hundred thousand pounds in gold and silver in this new bank, which they lent to the uh, to the government at eight percent, which is a pretty high interest rate for a government guaranteed loan. And to show his appreciation, the king said, "Okay, now you may print p r i n t a similar amount, one million two hundred pounds, so two hundred thousand pounds." and uh, lend it to your rich friends at high interest rates. So in effect, they were allowed to lend the same money twice. Well, then that leverage of two to one, which was, you know, which was really uh, quite generous, Mm -hmm. very generous, I thought, uh, has increased over the years. In the early years of the the, uh, 20th century in the U.S., federally incorporated banks had to have a gold reserve of 25%. So they were allowed to lend the same money um, four times. In Canada, when I was young, our banks had to have a cash reserve of 8%. So they were allowed to lend the same money um, 12 and a half times. Well, then in the 1970s, things really began to go all to pot. And our Bank of Canada and others adopted the ideas of Milton Friedman. They called it uh, monetarism. Basically, a deregulated banking system, and that leverage went up to 20 to 1 or more. And that's the reason I call them the, the mafia, money mafia in my book, because what actually happens is that they can invest uh, $5 million and leverage, up, leverage it up to $100 million in bank loans. And wow. Which, which then people have to pay back. And I, I put it this way. They invest $5 million in what I call blood, sweat, and tears money, sort of real money. Mm-hmm. And then they create uh, $100 million, which is just, just uh, computer entries. It doesn't, doesn't exist. It's just, a, it's just a giant Ponzi scheme. And they created out of... Well, we say it with thin air, but they just—it's just a computer entry, and then the people who borrow that hundred million have to pay it back a hundred million in blood, sweat, and tears money, plus interest. So we have this incredible system where they are really taking ninety-five percent off the top. We have this uh, uh, thing going on in Montreal, and you know the investigation where there—it's alleged at least that. One branch of the Sicilian Mayfew is taking two and a half percent off uh, off contracts in the city. Well, two and a half percent is a pretty hefty uh, slice for not contributing anything. <clears throat> but when some very small group of very rich people can take ninety five percent off the top, that is insane. That's grand larceny if there ever was any. And you look at some. Poor student, for example, that has to borrow fifty thousand to finish their uh, their education. The bank only needs to put up twenty five hundred dollars to create fifty thousand dollars loan for the student. So twenty five hundred blood, sweat, and tears money invested. Student has to pay back fifty thousand blood, sweat, and tears money plus interest. Now that's the system we've got, and it's got to stop. And what we have to do is we have to learn from the Canadian experience from 1939 to 1974 when the Bank of Canada uh, created near-zero cost money for the government of Canada. And in effect, we shared the money creation system between the the, uh, government and the privately owned banks. The system was worked perfectly, and we have to do something similar to that today to get Canada out of the mess it's in, and not only Canada, but of course the whole world because the whole system is the same. And we can no longer allow this handful of people, I don't know, a very, very, very small number of people to 
to take, you know, to to rake in everything, to buy up the assets of the world for five cents on the dollar. That's what they're doing. Five cents on we the dollar. We can't allow that to happen anymore. We have to change the system, and and have government start to create part of the money. And in my book, I rep, I uh, suggest thirty four percent, and use that money to start reducing taxes for the poor to stimulate the economy and to get it going and to reduce unemployment, I would say by half worldwide if we adopted the system universally. So there is a solution, and that's where it's got to start. There are a lot of other things, but the most important one, the most urgent one, is to get the money system under control and get the and get governments involved because we the people own the patent to create money. Banks don't have any rights. All they just have licenses. That's all, and it's just granted by Parliament or Congress or whoever. And we we have the power, but we don't use it. Our governments just sit on their you know, benches or whatever you want to call it, right. and uh, <laughs> and let the bankers uh, take us to the cleaners, while we cut back on on research and on scientific development and mm-hmm. on. All sorts of things, and we have a million unemployed young people in Canada, for example, and there are millions of un- there are millions and millions of unemployed people all around the world, and none of it necessary. So that's where we have, that's target number one before we get off under some of the other things. Mr. Hellier, what is your opinion, sir, on the fact that it seems that? No one is doing anything to promote the development of of um, alternative energy. You know, the price of gas in both Canada and the United States and other parts of the world is going up. The demand is greater. Mom and dad now have to take on the extra burden of, of you know, paying extra at the pumps for to take the kids to hockey practice, to take the kids to school. It's It seems like somebody... Or something is out there saying, you know what, we're just going to keep on milking the fossil fuel industry until there's no more oil anywhere. Because if we go to alternative energy, we're going to lose money. Right. You've just posed the um, the perfect follow-on question. You couldn't have picked a better one. And it involves the same uh, thing that I mentioned before, this amorphous group called the Cabal. Yes. <clears throat> And I define it as um, at the apex of the cabal, uh, largely centered in the United States, but it's international in scope. <clears throat> at the apex is the is the banking cartel. And next to that is the oil cartel. And next to that are the uh, CEOs of the of the uh, multinational corporations. And next to that are the intelligence agencies not exclusively American, but predominantly um, the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA, and then a huge slice of the American military. And they are the people who are really running the United States, have since, uh, oh, the early post-war years, and to a very large extent are running the world more and more all the time and in the process of kind of taking over control of the whole world. So the problem is, as you have just stated, first of all, there are exotic um, energies exist. Mm-hmm. Let me backtrack just for a second. I said the money was the most urgent problem. Global warming is the most important problem because we're just ignoring it and we've only got a few years to do something about it. And so here is a, a cabal that has the patents on what we call zero-point energy, maybe other forms too. I'm, I'm told that the Americans, with the help of their extraterrestrial visitors, have developed both zero-point energy and uh, and cold fusion, and there are other possibilities, but zero-point is the one I like best. And all you need is a box, a little box about um, you know two and a half feet square or something like that, to To provide all the power you need for your house, or your car, or your or your truck, or your tractor, your boat, your airplane, or whatever, 
their factory, and they have that technology. It exists, but they own it, and they are keeping it under wraps. And one can only guess that it's because they have trillions of dollars of assets, oil assets, and they want to cash them in uh, before allowing this uh, other technology to come into the uh, into the public realm and uh, and to take over, which it should. So what they're doing in effect, they're saying, we don't really care if the world's on fire, if our house is on fire. Let it burn, because we're just going to sit on this technology, and we're going to keep on rolling in the bucks as long as we can until uh, until we've. Uh, cashed in all of our assets. Now this this is one of this is really despicable. In my book I list a whole bunch of of headlines of projects that are starting, you know, for more mm-hmm. drilling in the Beaufort Sea and uh, off Newfoundland and in the Gulf of Mexico, more fracking, oh more goodness. extensions to the to the uh, tar sands and so on. Ms. Mr. Hillier, things. we have to take a commercial break, sir. Please stand by. It's great having you on the show, sir. And once again, from, I'm sure, Can- Canadians from the East Coast to the West Coast, thank you for your service to this great country. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the Right Honorable Paul Hillier, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, right here on the Exxon, as we continue from our broadcast centre in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. Don't go away. Cosmic Expo will be held in Brantford, Ontario, June 26, 27, 28, and will feature 24 internationally acclaimed experts and researchers of UFOs, crop circles, alien abductions, and much more in this three-day 2015 summer Canadian event. Experts in the field of extraterrestrials and alien encounters, out-of-body experiences, past life regression, soul reading, psychic and mediumship will all be presented with professionalism, integrity, and credibility, making the Alien Cosmic Expo the largest event of its kind in Canada for 2015. The Exhibitor Hall will feature a spectacular lineup of gifted mediums, psychics, astrologers, channelers, aura photography, healers, as well as books, DVDs, alternative health products, crystals, jewelry, and much more completing the venue with something for everyone. For all information and to purchase your tickets for the Alien Cosmic Expo, go to www.aliencosmicexpo.com. That's www.aliencosmicexpo.com. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Have you exhausted all traditional means of healing without success? Are you experiencing communications through ghosts, angels, or even extraterrestrials and want to validate these experiences? Or would you simply like to speak with someone who can help you find your life's purpose? I'm Dr. Joseph Mara, and I'm offering my services to humanity at this time through consultations. These consultations include angel card readings, guided meditations, life coaching, and energy healing. 
If you desire clarity of what may appear to be unexplainable phenomenon, then contact me through my website at a guiding light spelled L I T E dot com to schedule your consultation today. Until then, I offer you love, light, and laughter. My name is Michael Talstar, Canada's leading mentalist from Toronto, Ontario. Hi, my name is Sponza, and you're listening to my dad, Ron McConnell, on the XM. This is Psychic Dorothy from St. Catharines, and you're listening to Rob McConnell. Hello, my name is Holly Reeves, an astrologer from astro for You, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X Zone, with Rob McConnell. Welcome to The X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. <laughs> Explanation, the right Honorable Paul Hellier is my very special guest this hour. His website is www.paulhellierweb.com. That's P-A-U-L-H-E-L-L-Y-E-R-W-E-B.com. And uh, Mr. Hellier, as always, a great pleasure and honor having you on the show, sir. Uh, uh, Rob, before you go on, dare I uh, correct you on one thing? Sure. Canadian Privy Councillors are not right honorable. They, they reserve that for Britain and uh, I think Australia and New Zealand. Are, we're just honorables. All right. I guess I'm old fashioned, but, but the Honorable Paul Hellier. And, bef- and before, thank you for mentioning my website, paulhellierweb.com. And maybe I could put in a plug for my book um, and say that anybody, it's available in all the usual places, but anybody who would like a personally. Uh, a personal salutation and a personal autographed copy uh, can buy it through my website and uh, get the little extra. And that's only a limited time until the end of June. And that's at paulhellierweb.com. Right. All right, Mr. Hellier, you were a Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. You were a minister. You were under uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And, you know, the history is there. You were responsible for the unification of the Canadian Armed Forces. Where did your interest come, sir, when it comes to the UFO question, the extraterrestrial question? Because it seems that you're the only ranking member of any government who's ever come out and said, you know what, they're real. They are real, and more people should know about them. And more people should know more about them, and the government should start telling the truth about them instead of of telling uh, telling constant lies. But, you know, this this uh, how I got involved was really accidental. There was a young chap from uh, Ottawa, bilingual chap, uh, Pierre Junot, and uh, he sent me information on this subject and. I was honest with him. I said, Pierre, I haven't got time to read it. He said, well, just put it on a shelf somewhere, and uh, and uh, eventually maybe you'll have time. Then he sent me a book uh, called The Day After Roswell by Colonel uh, Corso. Corso. Yep. And I, uh, I said, I thought that looked interesting, so um, I intended to read it in the summertime when I go to Muskoka and have a holiday, and that's mm-hmm. about the only time I have to read. I looked for it in the summer, couldn't find it, so I took The Life of Pi, which I found fascinating. The following year, I was looking for another book and couldn't find it, and there staring me in the face was the day before, the day after Roswell. And so I took it and started to read it, and uh, I just wasn't too far into it and, until I came to the conclusion, this this is the real thing because I recognized the names of the generals and of the airfields that Corso mentioned, and they were ones that I remembered from my days in national defense. And uh, curiously enough, my my nephew was in the same compound at the time, and he came along and said, what are you reading? And I told him, he said, well, I'm a skeptic. 
I said, well, it's okay for you to be a skeptic. You're mm-hmm. still a free country, more or less. And I underline <laughs> the more or less. <laughs> and uh, so he, he went home, and a couple of days later, he said, I phoned the general, and the general said, every word is true and more. Where can I get a copy? And by then I had finished the book. And curiously enough, a couple of uh, Canadian ufologists, Victor Vigiani and Mike Bird, had invited me to speak at the University of Toronto in September, and I had absolutely no intention of uh, accepting. But I d- must admit that sometimes I procrastinate, and I just hadn't got around to telling them. <laughs> so after I finished the book, I said to myself, there are huge issues here, huge issues. I mean, the possibility of, of the United States Air Force you know, getting us into an intergalactic war or whatever. And the American people, who are um, most directly concerned, um, have the right to know about it. They've been picking up the tab, and uh, they should have they should have the information of what's going on in their own country. And uh, so it was uh, at that point that I said, I have a responsibility to people everywhere to get this out into the public domain. So before I decided to uh, go public, I had to do two things. I got uh, the general's number from uh, my nephew because I had met him actually at an air exhibit one day. And uh, so I phoned him. And before I could even say, hello, how are you? He said, every word is true and more. And then he he went on to say that uh, there had been face-to-face meetings between United States officials and uh, extraterrestrials from other star systems. And so with that assurance, Mm -hmm. I was prepared to go, but it just happened. I was getting married a week from the day uh, of the symposium, and uh, so I had to phone my my bride, who was was the widow of my very best friend ever, and, and the three of them and my late wife had been a foursome for many years, 25 years, I guess. And uh, so uh, when my wife died and uh, we were the only two left, I'd ask her if she would marry me, and she said yes. So I phoned her, and she was not really wildly enthusiastic about me doing it, but uh, said, okay. I said, it'll just be a one-off. And I didn't really know that I wasn't telling her. Well, it wasn't for, my crystal ball wasn't working very well that day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I went and uh, said that uh, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying over your head, because I knew it to be true, and uh, and I thought the public had a night to, the right to know. Well, of course, once I had said that, then information started coming in from all over the world. Documents, some classified, some unclassified one book after another, and I read, I can't tell you how many books I read, but literally dozens over a period over the last uh, 10 years. And uh, and I was uh, briefed by some of the best ufologists uh, in in North America and Canada, the United States, and some, uh, one from Britain and uh, and others. And uh, so I've had the chance to sort of grow into the situation. But coming back to this truth business, the, the extraterrestrial, the UFOs have been coming to Earth for thousands of years. And that is, that is perfectly clear to me now. And especially, you know, there are biblical references that can only be explained that way. And uh, there are other things that I could uh, explain that, uh, that indicate beyond question that they've been coming for thousands of years. But they didn't pay, m- they haven't had a heavy traffic until. Uh, just after the first atomic bomb was put off at uh, White Sands in the uh, uh, <clears throat> U.S., and uh, and all of a sudden they started taking an interest in what we were doing down here. And I have personified it like they have come to the conclusion that the children, that's us, are playing with matches. And we now have what we've never had before, and that is the ability to destroy our planet to make it uninhabitable for human species, the human species. And it could it could happen. Well, the day the, the, when the Americans really got excited about what was going on, 
sort of dates from Roswell in, uh, in July of 1947. Mm-hmm. There were actually two crashes there um, the same day, but they weren't discovered on the same day. And uh, what happened with the one that was first made public and the only one for a while was that um, the base commander at the Roswell uh, Army Air Base, as it was then, um, put out a press release through his press officer saying that they had recovered a disc. And uh, a few, that was carried in the local papers. But the, then his boss, uh, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, a few hours later put out another press release uh, and said, no, it wasn't a disc. It was a raw one target uh, apparatus held aloft by uh, neoprene balloons. And this was the story that was carried in the Eastern Press, the New York Times and the major, and the major papers in the East. And, the, of course, the first, the first one that was put out was the truth. The second one was an absolute lie. And the United States government has not told the truth at any time those 68 years from then until now and they're still not and they're just absolutely flummoxing and they're they're worse than that they're still putting out disinformation and misinformation and it just will not do as far as I'm concerned because there's too much involved there's too much at stake how many trillions have been spent on back engineering uh, the technology uh, what do they plan to do with it? Um, is it going? Is it being used positively and constructively, or, mm-hmm. or are there negative plans that might have a very serious uh, negative consequence for the for the human species? These are all things that we should be talking about and should know about. And that's one of the reasons that we, to give Alien Causes make Expo a plug. There's going to be a lot of the people there that know a lot about various aspects of these things that the government is keeping secret. The U.S. government, Canadian government, the Russian government, the Chinese government, but the, the U.S. sort of is the lead outfit in this uh, show, and and until they start telling the truth, I don't know whether the others will or not. But somebody has got to prod them to the point where they start telling the truth, because time is running out. And there's there's so many things happening, and you can't cover them in an hour show. You couldn't cover sure. them in ten hour shows, but there are so many things happening. And fortunately, we're going to have a lot of experts there, who will each one cover a little bit of the puzzle. And if you want to find out for yourself and become one of the people that's in the loop and knows what's going on, instead of just imagining or going strictly on science fiction, <clears throat> come to the, uh, the show and, uh, and listen to the people that are speaking there. Because it takes time. Going uh, Two years ago this month, um, I was part of the uh, Citizens Disclosure Hearing in Washington, where uh, Steve Bassett put together a panel of six former Congress people mm-hmm. who all of whom were skeptics. And they came and acted like they were a congressional pa- panel. And uh, yeah. and Steve had four, 44 witnesses uh, who all gave testimony under oath, just as if they were uh, talking to a genuine uh, congressional committee. It took us five days to convince the last skeptic. And... and it just goes to show you how deep the naivety is, which, going back to my book again, was one of the reasons that I said, you know, somebody has got to get some of this stuff in the public domain. I was the last speaker that day, and I only talked, I only answered a couple of questions for the chair, who mm-hmm. happened to be the holdout, and he wanted to know where some of the places were that the uh, star visitors came from, so I gave him four or five uh, from my earlier book, uh, Light at the End of the Tunnel, and then went on to do, discuss the cabal and who was running the United States a bit. And that little 22-minute clip went viral because there was such a thirst for 
more knowledge on this subject. The thirst is still there, and it's got, we've just got to try and quench some of it by getting more information out. And uh, it's starting, it's starting. Yeah. I was on a cross-country tour re- recently where we, we actually got four or five articles in the mainline press. Mm-hmm. Believe me, that was a breakthrough. Let me, let me ask you something, happen. sir. Let me ask you something. No. 1963, you became the uh, the Minister of Defense under Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. Am I correct? Correct, yes. As in your tenure as Minister of Defense, were you ever briefed by the high-ranking members of the Canadian military or the Canadian Armed Forces that there was UFO activity over Canada? Not briefs, no. I had uh, sightings reports, so I knew that they were. I knew that they were flying over Canada. Were these? Were these I assumed that they were these reports military reports or civilian reports? They were, well, they were they were collected by the military mm-hmm. and handed to me as a report. And about eighty percent of the of the sightings were um, uh, judged to be natural phenomena, and the other fifteen or twenty percent uh, were genuinely unknown and that's about the same percentage that the uh, that the british had nick pope was one of the first people i talked to after uh, i went public uh, 10 years ago and he was in charge of the um, of the ufo desk at the department of defense in in the uk and he said it was a very similar proportion that uh, they had that we had but i was too busy as you said to uh, unifying the Canadian Armed Forces to really be concerned about that subject at that time. About all I re- really did during that mm-hmm. period was uh, was to dedicate the world's first flying saucer landing pad at a little bilingual town in northern Alberta called St. Paul's. Right. And it's still standing as sort of a welcoming mat for anybody that uh, would uh, be interested. I personally, if I were a saucer pilot, wouldn't want to land on it, but... Uh, <laughs> It's a good, it's a, a good thing to have for for welcoming those that come in peace and uh, and cooperation. S- sitting back these years later, sir, looking at the days when you were Minister of Defense, does it not boggle your imagination that if these UFOs were so active and if the United States did have this information that you, as the Minister of Defense for Canada, were was were not made aware of this. What does this tell us about the communication between the United States and Canada? It tells you just how tightly the secrets are held, and there are people on the inside, and they work on a, a need to know. Mm-hmm. And it may it may surprise you that not even the President of the United States knows everything that's going on. And this goes right back to uh, the early days. Um, General Eisenhower was concerned what was about what was going on in areas 51 and uh, S4 and in Nevada, and uh, they wouldn't tell him. This the alternate government, the cabal, as I call it, wouldn't tell him. And he had to threaten to send in the first army to get permission to send four of his buddies that he could trust to go in and find out what was going on and to report to him and what they reported because there was one of them uh, a deathbed repentance recently uh, well uh, two years ago who made this uh, YouTube that was shown at the uh, press conference and um, they reported of course that what was going on was the back engineering of the uh, of the crash vehicles from uh, from Roswell, wow. but that that is the I think probably the last direct exposure of anyone going out there and finding out exactly what's going on, because they just they just assume that the president needs so much briefing, but enough to sort of keep him from being too upset, but not enough to know what they're really up to. And it and it's a very closed circle, and it, it applies in the military too. Uh, there was a, a naval chief of intelligence, and uh, someone I met as a result of my uh, getting involved was uh, 
an Apollo astronaut mm -hmm. um, and uh, who um, Edgar Mitchell. And he came up to Toronto and was uh, lecturing here, and he came and had dinner with us. And uh, he he knew this uh, uh, chief of intelligence, and he asked him about this subject, and the guy knew nothing about it. And when uh, Edgar told him a little bit about it, he was infuriated and went to somebody a little higher up, and said, I demand to know, and was told, sir, you don't need to know. And that's the way the system works. I have a quick question for you here from one of our listeners in Orlando, Florida. They sent it to me via Skype. The question is, why does he believe alien technology might solve our climate problems? Well, I, I didn't call it alien technology. It's uh, technology that was developed by the United States forces, and I say probably almost certainly in cooperation with the aliens. Gotcha. And they had, uh, they had zero point energy under control years ago. There was an exchange trip between uh, U.S. astronauts and, um, and one of the species. And when the Americans landed in, uh, on this uh, planet... Uh, we're, we're talking about the planet Serpo, right? Correct, yes. When they landed on Serpo, they found all they had to do was to plug into this little box mm -hmm. and get all of the power they needed. And that was, as you know, years and years ago. And uh, Dr. Michael Wolf uh, also said in a in radio broadcast, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that, that uh, the Americans, in conjunction with their friends... Star visitors had developed uh, both um, zero point energy and cold fusion, so that we know that the we know that the um, technology exists. We also know that a number of people have tried to to make it available to the public, and nearly all of them have had accidents of one kind or another. They have had their their labs wrecked, or their their equipment taken away. Uh, something not good has happened to them, and so the whole uh, the whole group that is most interested in alternative energies, mm -hmm. new energies, has has been intimidated considerably by the fact that the uh, cabal just doesn't want that technology to be in the public domain at this time, and will go to quite extreme quite extreme measures. To make sure that anybody that tries to violate that uh, taboo um, has second sober thoughts. Mr. Hillier, as always, whenever you're with us, time goes by so fast. I do want to thank you ever so much for joining us, sir, and I look forward to shaking your hand and thanking you in person for all your years helping this great big country of ours go forward. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting you and, um, and listening to um, colleagues who are equally uh, equally interested as we are and it's, so it's going to be a great event and uh, if I could just one last reminder to people if you want an autographed copy of either Light at the End of the Tunnel or mm -hmm. uh, Money Mafia uh, paulheaderweb.com I'll give it my best shake and get it out <laughs> to you <laughs> Mr. Hellier, thank you sir have a wonderful day thank you and you too Rob, good to talk to you nice talking nice to you enough. sir, bye bye Exo Nation the Honorable Paul Hellier has been our guest this hour. And if you'd like to get a copy of his book, autographed, that is, www.paulhellierweb.com. And uh, Mr. Hellier is going to be one of the speakers at the Alien Cosmic Expo, June 26, 27, 28, in Brantford, Ontario. For all the information on the Alien Cosmic Expo, visit their website at www.aliencosmicexpo.com. I'll be back on the other side of the top of the hour as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right here on the Starcom Radio Network. My name is Rob McConnell. This is X Zone. Don't go away.
start a story.